So in code first workflow, we start with the code. Every time we modify our domain model by adding a class or modifying one of the existing ones, we create a migration and then run it on the database. So let me show you how it works. First, we need to go to package manager console. So under tools menu, go to new get package manager, package manager console. The first time you want to use migrations, you need to enable them. So we type enable dash migrations, and this is not case sensitive. Okay, migrations are enabled. Let's go to Solution Explorer. Now you see a new folder here, migrations. So all our migrations will be stored here, as you will see shortly. Now back in Package Manager Console, I'm going to create our first migration. So we execute add-migration, and here we give it a name that identifies the kind of change we have made to our domain model. Because this is our first migration, I'm going to call it initial model. Okay, beautiful. Back to Solution Explorer. Look, under migrations, we have a new C Sharp class. So open this. So here's our migration. You see a call to create table method. And here's the name of the table being created, ASP.NET roles. If you scroll down, you see ASP.NET user roles, ASP.NET users, and so on. So why is this migration creating these tables? Where are they coming from? Well, this is part of ASP.NET identity, which our project uses to control authentication and authorization. Let me show you something. Back to Solution Explorer. Expand models and open identity models. Here we have two classes, application user and application DB context, which derives from identity DB context. So this is the DB context that I told you about earlier. It's the gateway to our database. Now this identity DB context is part of ASP.NET identity framework. So when I executed the add migration, entity framework looked at our DB context and it discovered DB sets in identity DB context, which reference classes like user, role, and so on. And that's why in our migration class, you see calls to create these tables for ASP.NET identity. Now, if you scroll down in this class, you will not see any references to our domain classes like movie or customer. Why? Because they are not referenced by our DB context. So I'm going to go back to identity models. And in application DB context, I'm going to add a DB set. So prop DB set of customer and call it customers. So this DB set represents the customer table in our database. I'm going to leave DB set of movies as an exercise for you at the end of this section. Okay, now that our DB context is aware of the customer class, I'm going to go back to package manager console and recreate our migration. So first I'm going to clean this up, CLS. Now add migration, initial model. Because it already exists, I'm going to use the force switch to overwrite it. Okay, the code is modified, so let's reload it. Now let's go back to our migration class and search for customer. There you go. You see this migration attempts to create a table called customers with these columns, ID and name. These columns are based on the properties of our customer class. You can see ID is an integer, it's not nullable, and it's identity column. A name is a string. Now let's run this migration and generate our database. So back in package manager console, I'm going to run update database. Okay, beautiful. Let's go back to Solution Explorer. I'm going to click this icon to show all files. You can see under app underline data folder, we've got this database file. Let's double click this. Okay, here's our database. Look at the tables. So we've got these ASP.NET tables, which are for controlling authentication and authorization. We also have this customers table with ID and name. There is also one more table here, which we should not touch. It's called migration history. So this table keeps track of the migrations run on this database. 
next time we run a migration, Entity Framework will put that in the migration history so it knows what version our database is currently at.